Thank you, and welcome to the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff webinar series brought to you on behalf of the Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau. Today's roundtable features a distinguished panel from three states who will discuss their experiences and challenges relating to cloud computing. I am Joyce Rose, your host and facilitator for today's discussion. Next slide, please. I want to thank our panelists for their time and effort in preparing for this roundtable, and I would like to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Linda? Um, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Jewell. I'm the Assistant Director, Chief Information Officer for the Arizona Department of Child Safety. Jay? Hi, my name is Jay Klein. I'm the Infrastructure Architect at the Arizona Department of Child Safety. Valley? Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Valli Manalan Trinjanam, who is shortly by Valli. I'm the Director of Applications, Maryland Department of Human Services. And last but not least, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Vastola. I'm the Chief Information Officer at the Florida Department of Children and Families. Thank you. A very distinguished panel. So next slide, please. Attendees are encouraged to participate in the roundtable with discussion, questions, or comments. All of the participant lines are muted now, but we will open them for the Q&A session at the end of the panel discussion. Please be aware that you can submit questions at any time using the GoToWebinar chat feature, and those will be queued up and addressed during the Q&A session. Once today's roundtable has ended, you may submit additional questions to the email address listed or to your federal analyst. If you have any questions, please email ccwis.questions at acf.hhs.gov. Next slide, please. So what is our format for today's roundtable? <clears throat> I will pose a series of questions to prompt our state panelists uh, in a discussion focusing on these topics, which I trust will give rise to an informational as well as lively discussion. We're going to set some context. In other words, we're going to take a look at uh, each state's uh, cloud infrastructure schematic. We are going to discuss uh, and understand the cost of cloud computing, some governance structure, contract and payment structures, staffing issues and managing vendor changes and upgrades, uh, understanding the build and release cycles and other complexities of cloud computing, and then, of course, uh, the time-honored lessons learned. Next slide, please. So to establish some context, our state panelists will explain their programmatic and technical cloud computing environments, starting with Linda and Jay from Arizona. Hi, this is Jay. <clears throat> um, basically what we're looking at here is the main components uh, that we use of a cloud-oriented nature. As a department and an agency, we were pretty um, – in a good spot, actually, when we started setting this up, as we were separating from another state agency at the time. So we got a very unique uh, ability to set up these services basically from the ground up. We didn't have to do a lot of transferring from an on-prem style infrastructure to cloud style. We actually got to set up almost everything ground up brand new. Most of our, of our current resources uh, sit in the Azure government tenant, so a lot of uh, VMs, uh, platform services, uh, software system services. Most of those things sit up there. We heavily utilize currently Office 365, obviously, for things like email, uh, internal communications on Skype. We're currently uh, utilizing OneDrive for lots of home directory information. We're <clears throat> leveraging... Uh, VMware's Verizon, uh, VMware's Horizon Air uh, infrastructure for a virtual desktop infrastructure. This allows uh, non-DCS uh, entities to connect to a DCS environment, but we don't have to worry about them connecting through a dedicated VPN on their equipment. It allows them to connect through our equipment, but from a hosted infrastructure side. Uh, we have another vendor that actually hosts one of our core business applications. They are also hosted uh, in the Azure government tenant, uh, as well as setting up on base for enterprise content management system, also in a Highland uh, hosted enterprise environment. 
For everything that we sit on-prem currently, the only uh, aspect we have are our core network infrastructure, so some Cisco devices and roughly about four physical servers. So we're currently sitting at about two racks of equipment uh, inside a hosted data center here in Arizona. Everything else that we have of roughly the 90 plus uh, servers is all in a virtual uh, hosted cloud style environment. Uh, next slide, please. A diagram of the Arizona Department of Child Safety cloud utilization. On the left is the existing system architecture. On the right, a more efficient, more user-friendly system of infrastructure that requires less on-premises data storage. So this kind of outlays uh, two of our, our main business applications that we're using. So this actually outlays a little bit of side-by-side -side environments as well. <clears throat> you can see uh, there's two groups of people currently listed in red that list DCS providers and DCS mobile application users. And this is what I'm going to reference mainly as our, our current environment versus the one that we're in the process of building and transitioning to. So DCS providers are, are entities and agencies that work with DCS uh, on some of our information such as foster care uh, providers and licensing agencies, and they connect into our environment to connect to our core business application, which is currently running uh, in another state agency that we connect to that we're, we're in the process of migrating off. They connect through those VDI, those hosted desktop infrastructure that's sitting inside VMware. That VDI infrastructure then talks to the identity management and all of our infrastructure services sitting inside the Azure government cloud, which has an express route link, so a dedicated connection back to our physical infrastructure structure where actually the mainframe environment and all of the back-end data actually lives. The more uh, current information we have for our, our actual users is we released a, a mobile application, something that our field workers can use for tablet-oriented information, but allows them to link into a mainframe backend. So it provides a much easier uh, use of their information and access of their information while they're out in the field without using either heavier laptops or heaven forbid, uh, paper and pencil. So they actually access that mobile application through another hosted instance that was that previous uh, Azure government uh, instance that a vendor provides, that Azure government instance then has an express route uh, back to our physical center, which then talks to um, our identity management and our Azure government cloud, which then talks back to our physical mainframe. Now, both of these systems, they work. The problem with it is at this point, and what we're trying to transition off, obviously, is a physical mainframe environment. So we're currently looking at transitioning to the second side, basically the right side of this slide, where all providers, all DCS employees, and even Arizona citizens can access all the data from our core business application through a common front end. So we're going to be going more to a, a hosted CRM. We're, we're actually planning on using uh, Dynamics uh, in 0365 to provide these portals and access which will link very similarly uh, as the previous ones, but provide, like I said, a very common infrastructure to get this done and allow us to store all the information necessary for this in uh, Dynamics itself and our Azure government environment, which will hopefully at some point in time in the near future remove our necessity of, of hosting that mainframe and that physical infrastructure uh, in the on-prem uh, data center that we currently have now. Linda, did you want to add anything? No, so that was a lot of information for everybody to consume, but you can see we are we are a hundred percent cloud except for our core networks and some of our legacy systems. Um, that wasn't a, you know, this is a three-year strategy in the making, and Jay made it sound very, very easy, but there were some things that we definitely had to put in place. Um, some good contracting to put in place, some good SLAs and vendor management, understanding all of those dependencies, especially um, when to run um, the network connections, the dedicated connections. Um, our state really wasn't set up uh, to for us to be able to leverage any kind of express route um, uh, or any kind of technology to uh, to cloud environments, dedicated um, uh, connections. And we really had to kind of forge that path ourselves um, uh, and um, come up with some things. So um, anybody looking at really building cloud utilization, do not underestimate some of the work that's required in the vendor management and contract management in order to make that happen. Your state might not be set up to have all of those agreements um, in place, especially on the network side. 
Fantastic. And Linda, thank you very much. And we're going to get we're going to explore some of those concepts that you just talked about uh, later on in our in our entire panel discussion. So let's move to the Florida cloud uh, schematic and Joe Vastola, please. A diagram of the Florida Department of Children and Families cloud architecture. Thanks, Joyce. This is Joe. So uh, Florida, similar but different uh, to what we just heard back in December of 2017, we completed the transition of our child welfare system off of the mainframe platform and uh, then transitioned the production, test, development, uh, and training environments, basically lock, stock, and barrel of our child welfare system into the Amazon public cloud. And so, so today we're, uh, we're running for uh, all infrastructure as a service components for our child welfare system in the cloud and included with this transition, um, probably like most states who receive services from a state data center, our state data center here in Florida doesn't just provide us with uh, infrastructure as a service, they're also our managed service provider. So they're the folks who are responding to uh, issues, hardware and network, et cetera, you know, keeping things patched. And so part of this transition uh, took us out of that uh, service subset and so included with uh, the move of the system to the cloud, we also had to create a structure and a set of contracts for overall managed services of the system. So, uh, so today we're sitting with our child welfare system uh, running uh, completely in the Amazon cloud and we've been able to leverage uh, the cloud environment for a couple things. Uh, one was um, extension of our uh, analytics environment. So in included with our state child welfare system is a data warehouse that we've used over time for all of the reporting, uh, both ad hoc and operational and, and any analytics that we've done. And so uh, there's been a goal here at the department in Florida to integrate our client data, all services across all our systems. And so uh, one of the ways we've been able to leverage the cloud is by uh, creating a environment for uh, big data. And so we've got a big data virtual environment now that links all of our child welfare clients uh, to all of the uh, client data that's, in, that, that's contained in our other uh, key legacy systems, including public assistance and our substance abuse and mental health systems, which still reside in our state data center. And so all of that data is uh, hosted in a virtual environment now that we've got in the cloud. Uh, and we use it for integration uh, analytics. We're starting to build a data science environment uh, set of tools so that we can begin uh, leveraging some of the capabilities of predict predictive analytics and machine learning above that. Uh, and then to extend our master client index, uh, which is uh, integrating and matching clients across all these systems into a uh, master data management environment. So we've got a um, uh, master data management tool that we've installed and hosted and have linked to all this data. Uh, we're in the process of establishing governance and, and the necessary controls and processes that we need to pro properly support that. And then in addition to that, uh, we've also in the cloud established uh, an environment for security incident and event management. So we've got a, a SIM tool that we're running in the Amazon public cloud that's hooked right now to our our public assistance environment will be extending that over time, but it's basically monitoring all logs across the um, basically the thousand servers that make up that system and the mainframe which it runs on. And we've got a, a set of contracted resources that manage and, and uh, monitor that, and then report back into my security team here at the department. And so our, our, our goal is uh, really to work towards extending this to pull all of our legacy data, all of our clients, get them all matched and hosted uh, available for analytics and integration in our, our big data environment and uh, really to continue supporting the system uh, for child welfare out of the cloud. Thank you, Joe. The whole uh, notion of programmatic big data I think is a fascinating topic and we may want to uh, add that to a list for a future webinar. Um, before we move on to Marilyn, um, I have a question. I, Joe, you mentioned that you're using the Amazon Public Cloud. Um, 
Arizona, Linda J. Is Azure a private, private cloud or a public cloud? So <clears throat> Azure is a, a public cloud, but Azure has two main um, identities uh, around to it. They have the commercial side uh, for your standard uh, businesses, and then they have the government side, which is reserved sp uh, specifically for state and federal entities. Um, the difference between those two is a lot of times on the capabilities, but also on the certifications that they provide in terms of the things like level of, of FedRAMP certification, the type of data uh, that you can host in there out of the box without having to input uh, some third-party options. The commercial side is very very, very close in terms of certifications to the government side, but uh, for those agencies that need to store uh, much more sensitive data, um, you know, be it uh, CGIS type data uh, or HIPAA type data, the government side tends to be a little bit uh, better in terms of making sure those certifications exist uh, and are approvable when you have an audit. Uh, the only problem that I will say with the government side is that it does lag uh, by about six months in terms of the features that are available on commercial side. Uh, it's a, it's a double-edged sword on that one, though, because you may lag six months behind, but by the time it gets to you, it's very well proven and very unlikely to cause any issues when you decide to use that feature. Great. Thank you, Jay. All right, Valley, uh, how about Maryland's cloud architecture, please? Uh, next slide, Irene a depiction of the cloud infrastructure for the MD Think platform. Sure, yeah. Hi, uh, this is uh, Valli Tiringanam. So um, I just heard both uh, Arizona and Florida. I, I think we kind of have a similar uh, type of setup here, but we, we are a little bit different in terms of what we are hosting here. So obviously we are using uh, Amazon uh, public cloud. Um, I heard uh, Arizona team talking about HIPAA uh, and uh, using their uh, government cloud. So we are not using government cloud. So we are using public cloud, and we are working on getting uh, the necessary certifications to store HIPAA data as well. So uh, let me start kind of giving you a quick overview about the uh, program that we are currently uh, engaged in the state of Maryland. Uh, this is called MD Think. You'll see the slide on the top right-hand side. It's a Maryland Total Human Services Integrated Network. It's an ambitious uh, project. Uh, the governor's office uh, started last year. The idea here is to bring all the agencies within the state of Maryland to use a shared uh, you know, infrastructure as well as a platform as a service. So we chose to go with uh, AWS, uh, commercial uh, you know, public uh, cloud. So what we have done since the uh, initialization of this uh, you know, uh, program since last year, we built the platform architecture, uh, you know, including the infrastructure, and there are a lot of platform services that we have built. The idea here is to bring the various agency applications, uh, kind of plug them in in the platform itself. Uh, it's a dedicated uh, platform we built uh, for the state of Maryland. Um, in terms of uh, how we have uh, architected the solution, we actually kept, kept it very simple. Uh, obviously, we have all the uh, layers to address security, data protection, uh, you know, access uh, rights, and everything is managed within Amazon itself, and we're using various products. Uh, if you start from the left-hand side, uh, we have the uh, State Security Administration, uh, staff, they actually manage all the user accounts. Uh, we are also uh, creating the consumer portal as well as worker portal. Both uh, will be managed by this team. Then we have the uh, customer portal, which will be used by the uh, clients. So we, we are talking about multiple agencies. Uh, child welfare is one of the applications. We are also bringing the uh, eligibility, like federal, uh, SNAP, cash type of programs as well as Medicaid. That will also come into this platform. And we're also bringing the child support application as well as on this platform. So three major applications are being built uh, simultaneously. Um, so the architecture-wise, um, we do have a mobile application support. In the uh, MDP platform level, uh, that sits on top of the cloud infrastructure hosted by AWS. Um, all the service calls are managed by our API gateway, so we focus heavily on microservice architecture. 
um, we do have a typical uh, web application and database layer, the multi-tier application. Each of the agency applications are built uh, with the uh, same architecture. We using the MVC pattern for that. Um, on the core platform services side, we have listed uh, almost all of the key ones here. The Enterprise Service Hub, this helps to uh, manage real-time data exchanges. We do have exchanges with uh, Federal uh, Data Hub, and there are other federal systems uh, to support our child support program. So we do have uh, all those uh, real-time data exchanges managed by Enterprise Service Hub. Then we have Rules Engine, which is uh, managed by our Coticon uh, product. Uh, DevOps, uh, I'll probably touch base more on the DevOps uh, during our Q&A session, but we do have an extensive set of uh, uh, platform-specific uh, tools that we have put together uh, for DevOps support. API management, uh, we have WSO2. This is the product that uh, we have used for securing all our APIs. Uh, identity management, of course, that's one of the key things that we use out of box from uh, two vendors. I don't want to actually talk about the names of those uh, product vendors, but they are available in AWS Public Cloud. Uh, one of the things I believe Joe uh, talked, uh, I think Arizona uh, talked about was the log management, security, monitoring. We have a Splunk as our uh, product to do that. Uh, BI reporting analytics, uh, we have uh, various products that are available uh, in our platform as well. Um, the bottom four uh, you know, uh, platform services, master data management, enterprise content management, enterprise search, and data lake. We completed building all of this within the last, uh, you know, I would say, 18 months. Uh, what we have done here is to uh, create this uh, platform as a service model, which allows any application can interact directly with the uh, you know, four data-related uh, you know platform service, and it will be like more uh, used as a plug-and-play type of uh, uh, you know design. And uh, one of the key thing I want to highlight here is the change data capture, we call CDC. This is the uh, uh, methodology we are using to keep the data lake up to date. So from various application databases, we are capturing the data and pushing them to data lake. So the data lake will be consumed by our uh, data scientists, analysts, and uh, you know, as uh, needed, we may open up that for uh, public consumption after the uh, de-identify any of the you know, sensitive information. On the uh, right-hand side, I highlighted the data exchanges, the different uh, system interfaces we have. Uh, so overall, this cloud infrastructure and uh, the MDThink platform currently um, is in production. Um, we have two pilot applications that we have uh, put into production already. Uh, in the, as of last month, we released uh, about 250 user uh, type of application for uh, one of the family investment agency. So that, that is going very well at this point. So uh, some of the key points I think uh, uh, I heard from Arizona as well as from Florida uh, are managing the vendors and keeping the infrastructure in place. It's not just keeping the cloud vendor in place, right? It's more about making sure the uh, workers and even the uh, clients, the consumers, they are able to access the application as and when they need uh, without any delay. So the infrastructure outside of the cloud is very, very important. And uh, that is one of the key uh, aspects that uh, the state of Maryland uh, you know, governor's office, uh, you know, focused, and we are building and extending bandwidth for a lot of our uh, agency uh, offices. So that's one of the key things. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about uh, some of the highlights uh, on how we manage the governance, the vendors, and what are the various things that we learned so far, uh, you know, in the Q&A session. Okay. Thank you, Valley.
uh, I think we can all agree that um, it takes a significant amount of planning and there's a heck of a lot of detail and um, designing and implementing a cloud architecture is certainly not for the faint of heart. So let's, um, let's actually begin our panel discussion. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'm going to um, plant the seeds here and get our panelists uh, in a discussion. So we're going to start with uh, Joe Vastola from Florida. I'm going to ask, please, which governance model has Florida employed when in the cloud? Hey, Joyce, it's Joe. I think uh, there's a couple areas of governance that we've had to address. Uh, since our, our whole system is there, like frankly, um, all of the processes associated with change management, uh, approval, uh, all of the governance, the application governance management processes have had to be um, modified. Um, mostly that's uh, because we're dealing with dollars a little differently. So in our state data center, we had a state budget that basically was capped. It was uh, an appropriated budget defined by the legislature, and uh, we really didn't have control of the changes or uh, up and down changes or the costs associated with some of the uh, you know, various projects and uh, enhancements that we would make. That, that all changes with the cloud. So now with the cloud, we're dealing with uh, what I'll call real money, right, because it changes the minute you make a change. And so, first of all, our processes for overall management of the system uh, from a financial perspective, from financial governance had to change, and we had to establish a whole set of processes to be able to review uh, understand the costing of changes, uh, estimate those costs both for cloud infrastructure, for managed services, for network capacity changes, for storage, uh, basically to identify all of those costs uh, and the impact that they would have immediately upon, uh, upon change and uh, establish a process for review, uh, comparison of budget, and then approval. And so the management infrastructure for the cloud for us is probably governance-wise, the, the key area that we've had to spend a lot of time and, and we've learned a lot about. Uh, that, that is extended also to, in some cases, the way we uh, charge back our customers. So uh, in our state data center, it was, it was relatively easy for us to determine funding by customer, um, which we have to do, as, as everybody would know, to charge back the right state and federal programs because our state agency, our state technology agency that was running the infrastructure would determine those costs and give it to them, give it to us separated by our primary application. So now we've got uh, one system running in the cloud. We've got uh, other multiple programs that, um, that feed and, and uh, information to and from the cloud and that require those services. We've got mixed networking that, uh, that traverses the path from the department to the cloud. And so we started to look at some of the challenges around how we uh, make sure that the, the, uh, the billing and the allocation of costs for resources that we put up into the cloud uh, are accurate and properly reflected. In some cases, it's easy to track. Right in the cloud, I know exactly what a server and, and storage and all of the elements that make up a particular environment cost. Uh, but I don't necessarily have that same breakdown uh, for network costs and traffic that flow over our network to Amazon. So governance uh, from, from our perspective was primarily around overall application and operational management. Um, that certainly has also influenced the way we estimate and communicate with our, uh, our state and federal partners. So all of that billing and all of the, the estimates that we need to properly create a cost-benefit analysis have to now take that into account, or as I said before, it was, uh, it was really handled by our, our state agency and uh, the data center staff that were there. Thank you, Joe. Um, Linda, Jay, Valley, do you have any uh, uh, additional information regarding governance models that you have employed? 
Um, hi, this is uh, Linda from Arizona. I'll, I'll weigh in here. I look at, um, I don't really see our governance model really changed. I mean, we we looked at the cloud as just another location that our um, applications were um, hosted, as well as some of our other infrastructure. Of course, Jay may disagree on that because it's a little bit more complex. But as far as, you know, really understanding, um, like Joe said uh, before, really understanding um, your change process, but but the cost that's where you need to um, that's where you need to really understand and get into that. That's where we touch in um, a little bit on vendor management, which I think we'll cover in a in a little bit. But as far as the the governance, I didn't really see anything changing. But understanding how the costs. Um, uh, operate, understanding the throughput that you need in your network to maintain good connectivity to your cloud services, and understanding how to onboard constantly changing um, cloud services. So at least on the Azure side, there are n new services being spun up that you can utilize um, in Azure environment a lot. Uh, so you need to know how to onboard and how to um, accept those changes um, in your environment. And yes, we are going to get into a deeper discussion about um, payment structures and other costs. Um, Valley, do you have uh, comments regarding uh, the Maryland governance model? Yeah, I have a couple of comments. I think I agree with uh, you know uh, both uh, Joe and uh, Linda. Uh, you know, we actually have uh, most of the times getting uh, in agreement with agencies on how the uh, cost sharing is going to work. That's one of the uh, key things. Uh, the good thing is uh, most of the agency secretaries uh, are already on board you know, with the idea of sharing a platform. So they signed a MOU, you know, Memorandum of Understanding, uh, from the beginning. So that uh, helped us to uh, just work out the details rather than trying to figure out how to get the agencies to come on board. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I think cost cost is one factor, but uh, the governance of how the licensing of various uh, you know products that we are using or each agency might be using, uh, the sharing of that was uh, you know one of the key things, and uh, we always struggled working with product vendors bringing their license into a cloud environment and have them share for the entire state was always a challenge. But uh, we, you know, we have a very good uh, legal team <laughs> that takes care of it, uh, working closely with our procurement, uh, and we were able to uh, navigate through, you know, most of the challenges with the end user license agreements, the SLAs, uh, with the product vendors. So that's one of the key challenges we faced, but uh, we were able to overcome that. So that the key point here is getting that early uh, enough in the governance model helped us to resolve all those issues uh, that we faced. And that's a that's a great <clears throat> segue into our next question, which I'm going to ask Linda and Jay to respond to first. And that question is, um, what are the changes needed in contract language, or licensing, or payment structures? Uh, with cloud vendors. Hi, this is Jay. Um, so contract language is an interesting thing because uh, that's something that obviously I don't think you're really going to you know, change so much. Contract language is just difficult to deal with no matter what type of contract you're working on. But there are obviously certain key things you need to look at when, when dealing with a cloud vendor and make sure that your contract sort of outlines these things. And everybody's going to be, every vendor is going to be slightly different in terms of how they deal with these things. So um, and I, depending on how you decide to use the service, everybody's going to be slightly different. But you you have things like uh, everybody's usually aware with with SLA service level agreements. So uh, when there's an outage, you know how does this happen? What do you how does the vendor deal with it? How do you deal with it? Uh, these need to be obviously clearly outlined. And the interesting thing about SLAs and these types of, of contracts is they might outline a very general SLA of I'll just use a, a generic example of 99.9 percent .9 uptime. But that 99.9% .9 uptime usually has an asterisk next to it, stating to the thing the fact of, of only certain types of services and how you configure them may be available for that level of uptime. So you really need to dig into the details about what you're looking at there. Plus, 
I've seen contracts before, and we've dealt with them specifically here at the state, where that SLA and that downtime only comes into effect when you've actually reported it to the vendor. So as a sake of argument, if a service goes down for the weekend and you don't report it to the vendor, that 48 hours of downtime technically doesn't count against their SLA. It only counts, let's say, on Monday morning when somebody complains the service is down and you actually start reporting it. So things like these in terms of how they deal and how they count with that SLA time uh, makes big difference across those vendors. And with SLAs, you also want to have a good visibility into their service health. Uh, one sort of problem that a lot of cloud vendors have providing is a level of transparency to look at the actual base level of that service health and that services that you're running off of them. Uh, they'll have basic ones that say, yes, the, the core services are functioning or they're, they're red, yellow, green, but figuring out exactly what's impacted based on those extremely high-level uh, dashboards that they provide is not easy to do. So you have to get into a lot of vendor management even beyond this to, to start being able to interface with that vendor, figure out what is actually impacted, get those details, and, and move across from there. Um, the other aspect, a lot of these things you have to deal with, obviously, is data. Uh, data is a huge one when dealing with these contracts because uh, it all comes down to what you're storing in the cloud. And obviously, dealing with, with government side of things, you're dealing with, with very sensitive data most of the time. Uh, from our aspect, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, of PII, personal information data, HIPAA-style data, and even, even more so than that. And making sure that whatever vendor you're utilizing has the ability of meeting the criteria to host that data is one thing. But again, there's always an asterisk when it comes to these things. And that is specifically stating that they may be able to host that in a secure manner, but it may not be done out of the box. There may be extra configurations that you need to look at and you need to do to make sure that that data actually meets something like HIPAA compliance. I'll give a, a very basic example of, of Google. Google Drive is, is very easily available to make HIPAA compliant, but out of the box. If you put information inside Google Drive, it is not HIPAA compliant. They'll give you the steps to actually make it HIPAA compliant, but you need to go through uh, an extra set uh, of requirements to make that happen. So, And also, when going back to data, it's about retention at that point. If you decide to leave a vendor, what happens to that data? Is it destroyed? Is it given back to you? Do you have verification that that data no longer lives inside that vendor's environment? Uh, you know, a lot of these agencies, ours included, lives and breathes on the data that we that we have and that we're able to provide. So making sure that that data management is, is one of the key aspects of looking at this, from my personal opinion, uh, is, is one of the highest on the list. Um, thanks, Jay. This is Linda, and I I just want to um, I just want to tag on a little bit uh, to that too. So even you know that's within the cloud um, environment, but it's also really um, it's really important to understand how you need to get data to the cloud environment. So we also looked at, and if you saw our um, our beginning slide where we showed all of our different kinds of network connections that we had there. Um, those were also considerations that we required to make our cloud healthy. Um, did we understand the throughput required? If we have um, if we have 2,800 employees and close to 8,000 um, connecting vendors coming up through our cloud, do we have the right throughput? And getting those um, those uh, contracts and negotiations and even hardware in place to be able to handle um, those dedicated uh, network connections. Joe or Valley? Yeah, this is Joe. Um, just to add to that, and again, setting the context here, our, our picture is one of uh, running our child welfare system up there. So we've had a number of contract, uh, interesting contract dynamics that we've had to deal with. First of all, uh, chances are when you're going to the cloud, uh, I can't speak for Microsoft, but you're going to be buying cloud services from a reseller. You're not going to be buying directly from Amazon. They don't they don't sell directly. I think Google also uses resellers. I know I think Microsoft you can buy it either way, but so you're you're when you're looking at SLAs, uh it's good to see what the cloud providers SLAs are, but the real ones that you're going to live and die by are the ones that you get from your managed service provider. Um, there's interesting and new elements that go into contracts when you're setting up these environments, and some of it relates to the model that you're going to plan to put in place. And by that, uh, as example, and specifically, I mean things like uh, are 
you and your staff and, and your organization going to be responsible for changing and modifying the environment, increasing the resources, adding resources to it? Are you going to push that to your managed service provider? You've got to decide those things because you'll have to contractually deal with responsibilities for things like the keys to the account and who makes those changes and uh, how the penalties relate to those kinds of elements. And I think then uh, just as an additional consideration, you know, there, there's also uh, a dis decision you have to make around uh, who owns the security of your cloud environment. So that, that's one thing we, we worked uh, really hard to understand and make sure that we had, uh, you know, locked up appropriately like we should. But coming out of our state data center, the state data center owned the security of that environment. Just by getting a cloud provider and a managed service provider, a reseller, it doesn't necessarily set up the responsibilities for who needs to secure that environment. So there's additional services that, uh, you, that you consider. If you're going to have the managed service provider have SLAs or penalties around security, and uh, th those are the kind of things that uh, we found to be different in terms of contracting, just the fact that there were elements, even though we had SLAs with our state data center that we didn't have to deal with, that had to be put into contracts as we went through this process. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, that's, uh, Valley? Yeah. yeah, this is Wally. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Joe. Uh, we actually, you know, thought about the same way, and uh, we obviously have to use a reseller. Uh, one thing that we did a little bit uh, differently is uh, obviously we wanted to go with a reseller who has uh, some reputation and also should be able to uh, take care of uh, issues if uh, something goes wrong. So we took uh, some time to narrow down to, uh, uh, you know, a set of, uh, you know, managed service uh, providers who can be a reseller. And uh, obviously our SLA, our, uh, you know, penalty clause and all those things, it took uh, obviously months for us to work it out with them. But uh, it, it was one of the key, you know, uh, consideration I mean, I'm, I'm talking about for any state uh, going to go with a cloud uh, provider, they, they have to think about all these aspects, what uh, Joe was talking about, because those are the key areas. Uh, you know, mo uh, the states typically have control when they have their own data center, but you probably are giving the control away when you are going to cloud. Uh, but there are several other uh, mechanisms uh, we have in place uh, for example, Joe, you talked about managing the keys. So we took control of that, and obviously from the state government side, we have a security team uh, that manages that part. Uh, similarly, you know, onboarding the agencies, onboarding users, we actually have control of all of that. So that kind of, uh, you know, takes the risk away from the vendor perspective, but we still own and control all those uh, access, who gets access, uh, and we also have the ability to monitor what's getting what's uh, you know getting out of the cloud uh, as well. Thank you. That's very very interesting, and um, I'm sure our attendees um, their ears are are maybe burning right now. Um, before we leave um, discussion about costs and payment structures. Um, I'm going to ask a question about egress costs and understanding that uploading data to the Internet, which goes out of the local network, is the definition of egress. What should states be aware of regarding those costs? Valley, would you like to start us off, please? Yeah, that that's one of the uh, this is Wally, This is one of the key uh, consideration. I mean, we we just started this entire program about uh, I would say a little over a year ago, uh, we had some estimation. Um, you know, initially working at uh, you know the current usage from the various uh, agency applications, and then expecting uh, either a similar or uh, more than the usage of uh, what was uh, you know being uh, trending. Uh, the good news is uh, based on what we have observed. We were able to control, uh, you know, the cost on, you know, the egress, uh, but we can only control to certain extent because, you know, every agency has the right to uh, get the data out of the uh, platform for their own use. 
So we, we are still trying to figure out a, a method, you know, on how to actually keep this in an optimized uh, way. Uh, I mean, we are still figuring it out. Uh, but one of, one of the areas that we may probably find out maybe a couple of years from now, once we have uh, identified trending, we should be able to uh, put some uh, control around this and find a way to offload some of the data. Uh, we, we talked about like using uh, you know, the snowball option, and uh, you know st we still have some of the data centers uh, in the state where we could offload some of the data without using the uh, you know network bandwidth. So that's something that uh, you know we are still considering. And that is one of the other aspects when we negotiated with the uh, reseller uh, uh, how we are, we are going to actually uh, bulk download data uh, without impacting our cost. So that, that's one of the key things that we considered as well. Okay. Linda, Jay, Joe, comments? Hey, this is Jay. Um, well, egress costs are, are an interesting thing because uh, a lot of times, depending on the actual cloud vendor that you're dealing with, egress costs uh, you know, may be uh, more or less. So uh, I'll use, obviously, State of Arizona as an example. But for a couple things, um, you, know, you can look at egress costs, obviously, from the state data center to the cloud. But you also have to look at egress costs, obviously, from the cloud to either you know, external agencies back to your state data center, uh, people that are consuming uh, that data you know, out of that cloud environment. When you start shifting uh, an infrastructure from an on-prem style environment to a cloud environment, um, you know, one of the obvious things that changes is, is the, you usually have less compute infrastructure on-prem because you're shifting that to the cloud. But you have to bolster that uh, usually with some network infrastructure on the back end. So you can actually support now all the connectivity required to support that egress traffic and that in and out data now of your physical clients that are sitting technically on-prem and your cloud-based resources. The other aspect you have is for us, uh, I'll use Azure as an example, um, egress costs out of Azure uh, are are actual costs you have to deal with on a monthly basis. Um, but it depends on the type of traffic as to whether or not you're actually charged. So looking at the resources that you're dealing with and making sure that you're grouping proper resources together so you're not doing uh, anything like splitting a resource that does a lot of data consumption, so part of it is on-prem and part of it is in the cloud, uh, to try to reduce those you know, that amount of traffic that's going through and the obvious amount of cost. Uh, going back to Azure as an example, though, they do allow certain certain types of egress traffic to be 100% free. Um, they want you to use certain services, so they give this to you as a benefit, uh, with that example mainly being backup and restore. I can back up all of my physical infrastructure on-prem to a storage infrastructure sitting inside Azure, and if one of those resources dies and I need to restore that uh, from that backup, that egress traffic is 100% free. None of that is actually charged to me because they want me to consume that service. Uh, so it really depends on, on what you're actually using these things for. Okay. Joe, Linda? Uh, this, this is Joe. Just uh, one additional point to add to, to all that good information. Uh, when you're considering some of your data movement costs, it's, it's not just egress from the cloud to you. Uh, it may also be uh, communication based on the structure of your cloud provider and the solution that you've got up there. And specifically what I mean by that is, for example, in Amazon, uh, they have different availability zones, which are basically data centers throughout the country. And depending how you structure your application, you take advantage of those availability zones and you run uh, instances of your application across them to get what is basically immediate or near immediate disaster recovery. And so uh, in Amazon, when you're spanning availability zones, you're also paying for the network traffic that goes between them. Um, so it's not only coming out from the cloud, depending on your cloud provider and the, and the structure of your solution, you may also be paying for data that moves within the cloud uh, and its structure. Very interesting. Linda, do you have uh, additional comments? Or? Um, no, I don't have anything to add on um, egress. I think um, everyone co uh, covered the topic quite well, actually. Cool. Okay, let's move on to um, another topic, and that's uh, personnel. Um, and Valley, I'm going to ask you to start 
Um, what considerations should states give to the type and number of IT staff to support the cloud environment? Sure, yeah, this is Wally. Um, this is actually one of the uh, interesting topics because this is something that I'm managing uh, for the state of Maryland. So obviously, when we take uh, you know applications into cloud, uh, we try to use as many as products as possible instead of uh, you know doing any customization. Uh, what this means is we have to have specialized uh, you know uh, resources with experience in dealing with the specific products. Uh, when you know we were dealing with uh, probably you know, mainframe days or client server architecture days. Uh, we might be able to use resources who could actually, you know, well versed with the multiple uh, products or technologies. But unfortunately, with the uh, cloud computing, uh, there are resources who are specialized in specific products, and that's the only thing they actually do. Uh, you know, for various reasons, uh, we want, uh, you know, the isolation in terms of, uh, you know, separation of duty, um, as well as we want to actually uh, optimize the resources that are available to get things done efficiently and quickly. So this posed a lot of challenges for us when we try to uh, find a way to get the resources, mostly on the uh, you know, uh, vendor side as well as on the state side. So we had to uh, find resources with specific skills, uh, and there are a lot of uh, areas where we need to have some overlap. Uh, so we have to kind of uh, consider all those uh, factors before we can get the resources with the specific skill set hired. Uh, one of the challenges we face, uh, we currently still face, when we try to hire resources through our vendors, they also try to find these specialized uh, skilled resources, and they actually, you know, I, I would say uh, five or six out of ten times, they probably are. Uh, you know, struggling to find the right resource for us. But, you know, we, we are taking our own time and doing some research in the market to find the right resources. Uh, mostly we are using our IDIQ type of uh, uh, contracts. So we are not really using uh, one vendor or specific vendor to do all our work related to infrastructure, platform building, or even application development. So we actually are kind of putting the structure in place in identifying the resources. And we, it is one of the challenges on the state side as well. Uh, with the uh, cloud computing, a lot of folks who are familiar with the uh, mainframe or client server ar architecture, they have to be retrained to learn about mm -hmm. the new technology. So that is another area we, we are actually, you know, uh, continue to work on to, uh, you know, improve their skill set as well. Um, Linda, how did Arizona approach um, considerations regarding IT staff supporting your environment? Yeah, um, you know, th it's an interesting um, dynamic, and we're a little bit different than uh, than what Maryland, I think, um, had to overcome. So as Jay had mentioned earlier, we were separating from another agency, so we literally built our IT um, group from the ground up, which means uh, we went um, we went cloud first. If you uh, want to call that a strategy, um, everything that we wanted to do, we wanted to build in the cloud. And likewise, when we went to hire resources, we looked at it specifically for building the cloud infrastructure. I can tell you we have um, 90 um, uh, servers uh, up in the cloud, 90-ish. Um, we have all different kinds of connections going up. I probably by the end of this, we'll have 100, between 120 and 150 when we're done with our CWIS implementation, I would say. And um, with that, I have one infrastructure architect. We have three um, three server admins. And so we've been really um, we've been really hiring for attitude, and then we train on the aptitude of managing in the cloud. 
there are not skill sets out there um, required to manage the kinds of infrastructures that we're building, um, at least not at the salaries we pay at the state. So we're looking at um, we're looking at ways that we can train, use our premier hours um, to to have some trainings for the um, for the staff. But I can tell you, we are lean. We have really good standard operating procedures. Um, we understand um, our security. We do not have managed service providers um, that do a lot of those services for us. We do not deal with resellers. We deal directly with Microsoft itself. Um, so I think that that's also cut um, and and had us uh, better manage our um our capacity as far as staffing goes um, and the functions uh, we provide. Uh, the the other thing to that, and we kind of touched on it a, a little bit before when it came to the governance. So you have to have a really structured way, you know, um, so while you may have people that are able to connect, and it is a different skill set than just, um, you know, uh, touching uh, touching boxes and looking for flashing green lights. There is some, there is some, uh, uh, there's more to managing um, cloud infrastructure and understanding those reports that Jay said were a little bit nebulous and understanding how to read them and, and determine if you, the health of your environments. Um, but understanding, you know, change and release management, understanding the impacts, um, uh, having good incident management process that you know that you understand when a service is down, how it's impacting. So those are the soft skills that you also need to build up, um, not just being able to manage cloud uh, cloud services. Great. You uh, you mentioned uh, the ability to be nimble to changes and upgrades from cloud vendors. Joe, I'm going to ask you, um, what is it that, that you've done that allowed you to be nimble to those changes and upgrades? Yeah, I think probably the uh, probably the best thing that we did to, to help us through this process was um, we really – picked a group of people and we educated them on what they needed to do and we supplemented with uh, external help. So there's really two, you know, two kinds of um, what I'll call skill sets that you need to move and operate systems or solutions in the cloud. You know, one, one are our great wrench turners that we all have who know how to create an architect and uh, develop a cloud environment. and. Uh, those are tough resources to train and to find and to retain uh, because there's a lot of demand for them. And so uh, in our case, uh, we have a small group of those folks who uh, work with our managed service provider to keep things in check, and then we rely on agility in, in the scaling of our contracted services with managed service providers and application providers. I think the second area, uh, the second skill set that helps us to move and to really make sure that we're focused on the things that we need to keep keep things moving smoothly um, is uh, what I'll call cloud management. And I, I think uh, Linda touched a little on that, but you know you got different skills there that you have to deal with. You're managing an account now. It's your account in the cloud. You're monitoring that account. Account. We've had examples where even though we're paying all these uh, service providers, we find a you know, a, an instance or a storage bucket that's not con connected to something and that's showing up on our bill. For whatever reason, we needed it during testing. We don't need it anymore, and it hasn't been removed. So you've got a whole monitoring process that you have to create to keep that environment efficient and clean. We've had uh, differences in the way folks uh, show up to audit our environment, and so and often we're, we're educating those. So uh, I guess I, I would sum it up as... Um, as talking about those two main focus points around the architecture and the work you do to create, manage, monitor, and enhance the cloud environment. And then really there's the work you do to, to manage the, the peripheral elements that, that keep it running and keep it running smoothly. Thank you. Um, okay, related to build and release cycles. Um, what complexity and time issues um, were introduced resulting from utilizing the cloud 
Now I ask Linda and Jay to start and then Valley to contribute, please. Um, yeah, so uh, the build and release cycle. So I think one of the one of the really important things to understand is how um, how you actually move and spin up your environments um, uh, to be uh, to be efficient. So there's two parts of this. So in an on-prem solution, you can have dedicated build, um, uh, build test um, training environments, and you really also you really need to rethink that in a cloud environment as well. Do you always need all of the um, all of the infrastructure up all of the time to manage throughout your builds? The other thing is really making sure you understand and be, and are able to leverage. Um, kind of the scripting and the buildup of these um, of these environments um, as you move your um, as you move through uh, your build and really uh, build and test cycles. So um, understanding how you move and and leverage tools like the STS to to move your configurations through. So I think those are really important considerations that you know um, having dedicated environments um, will cost um, and will cost you money in storage and um, other costs that you may not have considered before. So it's really important to understand in your build and release cycle exactly when you need those environments and how to shut them off. Valley? <clears throat> yeah, that that uh, this is Wally. That, that's one of the uh, key aspect of uh, you know spinning the environment and also making sure the release is happening without any issue. Because typically, when you have an on-premise uh, environment, as uh, Linda was pointing out, you will have dedicated team. But with the cloud environment and with multiple application teams are working. Uh, it becomes really a bottleneck when you have like a, a team that manages the uh, release cycle, or, you know, doing the build, uh, getting setting up the environment. So we rely on automation. Uh, I would say we are close to about 60 to 70 percent of automating the infrastructure building, and uh, close to about 90 percent for our uh, you know build and release uh, cycle management using the various uh, you know scripting tools. Uh, one of the key things uh, is, you know, when we build these environments, uh, in, in a typical, you know, architecture, when we build with high availability, uh, you know, we talked about the disaster zones and everything, we, we tend to actually build the architecture to mimic uh, close to what, you know, production would look like, at least for our initial testing and everything. After the uh, initial testing and everything is confirmed, we don't have to maintain that kind of uh, infrastructure. So that's one of the lessons learned from uh, our operations so far. We don't have to maintain you know, uh, a similar infrastructure in a non-production environment. What that uh, requires is a little bit of change in the way we architect the solution and help the architecture to dynamically scale rather than trying to have your entire uh, architecture rely on you know the configuration that you are defining in the beginning so there are a little bit of uh, uh, you know change in the uh, uh, architecture and the scripting helps to achieve that uh, the pipeline for our ci cd you know automation of uh, build and release we rely mostly on the development team and the testing teams to automate all of this so the DevOps team's job is to make sure that they help the initial, uh, you know, setup, and then from that point onwards, they will only monitor and, uh, you know, look at the logs and try to identify any anomalies. So that's how the uh, setup we, uh, we have in place uh, works. Uh, our goal is to have 100% end-to-end, uh, you know, uh, DevOps uh, release cycle. Including automation of uh, you know testing our scripts, uh, we, we are building like a, a automation uh, test library uh, with various scenarios for uh, different applications. 
so we have a dedicated team that closely works with our development uh, you know, team to create those scripts as well. So th th this is an interesting topic, and it, it's a, uh, I would say, ever-changing uh, nature of the various uh, products and tools available in the market. The more you think about the change that's happening, it, it will be very hard to keep up with the uh, changes. So what we have decided to do is we don't have to uh, use all the available services or products that are claiming it's going to improve our efficiency. Uh, we will actually you know, look at this and only if required, we will adapt to it. So that's our strategy so far. Great. So, um, so that we save time for our audience Q&A, um, we're going to move along to um, lessons learned. I'm going to ask Joe to start. Um, let's spend about a couple of minutes uh, each and let's talk about the most significant lessons that you have learned. Joe? Okay, this is Joe. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the lessons kind of span a number of areas. I think, I think first uh, I would say that early on we spent a lot of time um, working over SLAs and what we thought would be the right SLAs, and ultimately uh, that turned out to be not a wise use of time because, quite frankly, you're going to do a deal with a cloud vendor and potentially a reseller, and they're going to give you their SLAs, right? Uh, Amazon is not going to negotiate with the Department of Children and Families here in Florida and change their whole national structure uh, for SLAs because we're putting one system up in the cloud. So um, I, I, I always tell folks there's a, a number of things that I put on the one page of important things when I started this, and the page of what really was important is different. Um, we learned a lot about the reality of software licenses. So. Uh, you know, we're, you're hearing a lot of good information around being able to spin up new environments and take advantage of the cloud and expand that environment as you need it and contract it as you don't. Well, that's true with the cloud, but it's not necessarily true with your software licenses. Um, you can only span to the level of license that you have, and depending on your solution or the, the you know, the vendor products that you've got there, if they're not all subscription-based, then you're probably limited in what you can expand to. So making sure that uh, the, the license approach that you take uh, when you start uh, is appropriate, is, is spending time on that is, is well worth it. Uh, we, we went through a lot with the number of vendors on licenses down to uh, where vendors uh, even told us that our on-premise license that we had in our data center didn't transition to an in-cloud license. And so uh, in some cases, you need to expect your vendors to not have answers for you because they, they may not have all of these things worked out, and you'll have to work through it with them. Um, I think uh, we, we, really, um, we really underestimated the, the amount of uh, change that we would have to go through just in managing the cloud. You, you've heard uh, the panel talk about a number of things. You know, you're not just changing an application or an infrastructure to move to a cloud. You're putting contracts in place. You're dealing with all these things you've heard uh, discussed on, on the uh, webinar today. And so uh, there is an amount of work there that isn't a part of your normal project that you have to make sure you're staffed and ready to do. Um, I know from our perspective, uh, we had a lot of interest um, from uh, our legislative staff and what we were doing, what we were doing with the funds that they that they had provided to us, and so uh, as you start out on this this course, I think there's some time that uh, is well spent in marketing and communicating around where you're going and what you're doing. I think uh, in addition to those areas, I would say that um, the procurement process, uh, the, the, the more that you can leverage something that's in place. So we had, uh, for example, we originally started out and planned to do uh, what we call an invitation to negotiate here in Florida, which boils down to the longest, hardest procurement process that, uh, that you would ever want to apply. And then as we looked, we found a uh, national contract that we were able to have approved for uh, use here in Florida that uh, turned our procurement into um, you know, an RFQ-based procurement, and that took literally six months off of our project. 
um, just on the front end. So uh, look look at the contracts that are available. Um, make sure that you're leveraging opportunity, however your state uh, you know handles procurement, whatever your procurement requirements are. Um, consider penalties. Uh, we worked with a number of managed service providers while we were procuring. Uh, penalties were a surprising, um, surprisingly something that uh, they weren't they were ill prepared to discuss. So uh, I believe when we're talking about moving systems uh, like a child welfare system or public assistance assistance system, they are primarily business systems with overnight batch cycles and all of these uh, nuances necessary to uh, complete a cycle of financials and everything. And, and most of the managed service providers we talked to were used to solutions. Uh, like for one example, our managed service provider runs the um, runs the uh, online site for the NFL. So they're very used to on game day, they get so much traffic and uh, expanding that infrastructure so they can handle that traffic and then uh, condensing it again on, on non-game days. But they weren't ready for systems with overnight cycles. So there, there may be some curveballs you throw at them with the type of systems, some of the requirements that we have uh, in state government around contracts, some of the liability elements. I think it was a surprise that, uh, to me that they were a little unprepared for those discussions. And ultimately, whoever, whoever you select, depending on your model, you may have to help them through it. Um, I, I would say that uh, it's important to um, – to consider early on your approach, right? So you're either moving workload like database function or infrastructure, uh, you're, you're lifting and shifting an application, or you're re-engineering it to take a full advantage of whatever your cloud provider and infrastructure uh, enables. I, w I would think uh, about all of the benefits, because there are, I think, uh, benefits to each one of those. Um, and make sure that uh, you're maximizing those benefits. Um, and I think then once you've implemented, I really, I really think it comes looking at the staffing and the, um, the elements of how you operate and manage a system that's running in the cloud and application that that, that you have to consider. And uh, things like ongoing agreements. So when we uh, create new instances in the cloud. Right. For a while, we were going through a process where our, vent, our managed service provider had to submit another statement of work. They didn't have a a la carte menu of costs for instantiating and architecting and then uh, operationalizing an instance. And so we've worked through those activities to be as flexible and, and operate as agile as we can as we move forward. Um, in some cases, we got to the point where it was taking almost as long to gin up a resource in the cloud with all these dynamics and statements of work uh, that we might have well not been in the cloud. And so we kind of challenged ourselves to say, hey, we're in the cloud. We have these on-demand services. How do we align our, our processes and all the things we do to make it efficient? Uh, I think those in the, are the Joe, for the, uh, for the sake of time, uh, we have several questions in the queue. But I want to give um, Linda and Jay and Valley a chance to um, add what they what they believe was their most significant lesson learned. So um, please go ahead, Linda. Hi, Jay. This is, this is Jay. Um, I'd say one of the biggest things we had to deal with and, and, and basically rethink about uh, was vendor relationship management, both on the boots on the ground side, that being things like our, our server team. Uh, all the way up to to infrastructure level, contract level, CIO level indeed. Uh, we have an extremely tight relationship now uh, with Microsoft. So we have Microsoft you know, on premises uh, usually at least once a week to discuss, hey, what are the new services you're offering in the cloud? What is your roadmap coming down the pipeline? So we can create these plans. We can know that we're going to ingest these services if we need to correctly and that we're using the current services we have to the best of their ability. Microsoft's constantly adjusting things like costing models, availability solutions, being able to go through and, and readdress our current services to new costing models and new options uh, that they release on a continual basis allows us to be uh, always on the edge of making sure that we're spending money correctly, we're spending money wisely, and you're utilizing the services to their fullest extent. And going back on some of the, the IT personnel issues, 
our server operator people, and, and we all know how, how IT people love interacting with other people, the big thing about it is they need to interact with vendors now. If, if we're majority cloud environment, my server level people, there's something wrong with the vendor itself, with the hosted server it's, uh, service itself. They now need to interact with other people because they can't solve the problem on their own. It's not just talking to another guy in an office or a cube. It's getting somebody on the phone and it's creating these channels, both direct channels, uh, creating tickets inside a ticketing system, as well as back channels to people that you've dealt with at these vendors constantly to ask them, hey, is there an issue? What's going on? Can I get a heads up on something? So creating those really tight relationship with vendors is going to make sure that you understand everything you need to in terms of the current roadmap, future roadmap, current licensing issues, making sure that you're using these services correctly, and making sure that your staff has those open channels to communicate uh, what they need to and get the answers that they need as, as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Jay. Um, we're going to move now into the attendee Q&A, um, and we'll give Linda and Valley the first chance to answer these questions, given that they didn't provide their lessons learned. So um, that concludes the discussion portion. So now I'd like to invite my colleague, Nick, to run the Q&A session. Nick? Hello there, everyone. This is Nick Moser, Junior Analyst with the Division of State Systems. I'm going to read our first question, and it actually is directly for Florida, so sorry for the mix-up there. But, um, Joe, did you have any difficulty integrating the cloud CWIS with on-prem medical and benefit systems? And then the follow-up question is, do you use MMIS to validate and pull client information into the CWIS? Yeah, so um, I, ha I have to confess that our, our CWIS is our SACWIS renamed, and so uh, we're at the, process, at the point now where we're term, determining how to get data in and out of the system, what the final architecture for it will be. Um, I think uh, ultimately, though, um, we're not seeing any issues in moving data because we do move data from other systems, as, as the question alluded to. So we're, we're moving benefits information in and out. The system is connected to our public assistance system. We have a robust interface there for um, Medicaid eligibility determination uh, and, and all of the data that has to flow. And so basically the, the cloud is sitting as a component on our network. Uh, and we really, uh, once we resolved all of the network connections, which is, was an interesting process, you, you learn how much a system is connected to when you move it. Um, it really was, uh, once, once we had that done, it, it really does sit like a application within our network uh, with the right capacity, uh, given the size of the pipeline that we've got to move data back and forth. And so uh, our, our challenge, too, is that we receive data from external providers. Uh, our child welfare system uh, has an outsourced component to it on the service side, and so all of that data flows still in from our state network uh, through to our connection to the application in the cloud and then, and then to our CWIS. Thank you very much. Operator, do we have any questions over the phone? And if you can remind participants about how they can ask questions, please. Thank you so much. As a reminder, if you have a question over the phone lines, please press star then one. Unmute your phone and record your name clearly so I may introduce your question. Presently, I have no questions in queue, but again, please press star then one anytime. Thank you very much. And just as a note, I want to make sure that uh, this has been such a fascinating presentation and webinar, and we want to be respectful of your time. So if you do have questions and we are unable to get them answered within the time frame that we have allotted, with your permission, we'd love to follow up with you and with the panelists afterwards to get you the answers to those questions. And um, ideally, we can post them online as well. It may be the case that the question that you ask helps a fellow colleague that that you have out there, perhaps in a different state. Thank you very much, everybody. Operator, do we have any questions in the queue in that interim? No, we do not. Thank you. Thank you. I will now read our next question. So the next question is for Maryland. What is the vehicle for your real-time data exchanges, i.e., what tool or enterprise service bus, et cetera? Okay, so for, uh, this is Wally. Um, for our real-time data exchanges, uh, we actually are using the uh, Apache uh, products. 
So uh, one of the things that we uh, decided to do from the beginning is to use uh, for almost all our uh, products to be open source. So we, we actually have uh, used the Apache product to build the enterprise service bus. So it's a very simple uh, messaging system uh, that actually connects uh, you know, in a very simple uh, way with uh, the external or internal real-time data exchanges. Uh, we use uh, you know, XML and JSON-based exchanges. So one of the things that we decided to do, as I said in the beginning, is keep it very simple. That's one of the lessons learned from our perspective also. Keep it uh, you know, a simple solution and a repeatable way to uh, leverage the same code as much as possible for all of our uh, data exchanges, for real-time as well as for bulk data exchange as well. Thank you very much. Operator, do we have any questions over the phone? Uh, no, we do not. Please press star than one, unmute your phone, and record your name if you do have a question. Again, I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Uh, Joyce, I'm going to do a quick time check. At what time do you want to transition to concluding this webinar? I want to inquire whether we have room for another question. You certainly have room for one question and maybe two. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I've seen a couple of different questions related to cost, so I'm going to combine a few. Um, so please bear with me. I'm curious whether your state IT organizations led or hindered your movement to the cloud, how well the state IT organization does in cloud management and governance, and whether there is any redundancy between roles state IT insists on filling and what is offered or automated on the cloud. And regarding rates, do state IT charges negate the financial benefits of moving to the cloud? And uh, an additional follow-up from another participant, do any of you believe that this transition to cloud services has saved you money compared to the previous system? Yeah, this is Wally. Um, I just want to quickly uh, point out, obviously uh, our analysis points out that we will be saving uh, several millions of dollars. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we can actually slice and dice this in many ways, but however way we did, obviously we realized uh, consolidating uh, many data centers that we use within the state of Maryland, uh, many agencies have their own IT team and IT budget just for hosting alone. Uh, you know, bringing everybody into one platform, uh, you know, and use the like, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service definitely uh, is expected to save uh, several millions of dollars. So cost saving definitely is there, no question about it. Uh, in terms of how we are going to achieve it, how we are going to share the uh, various resources, you know, whether IT resource or your license that you may have already uh, purchased for on-premise use. Those are the things, uh, you know, require some additional uh, discussion up front. And then once the agencies agree, you know, definitely the cloud model would benefit, uh, you know, the entire state and individual agencies in the long run. Uh, this this is Joe. Uh, just to add to that, um, I wrote down a number of the questions. So, did the state IT organization help or in, hinder? Uh, here, here in Florida, uh, I would say that our state IT organization helped. Quite frankly, they had to approve our procurement mechanism for alternative services, alternative IT services. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot they could help on in terms of us selecting a cloud provider because uh, in some cases, in many cases, that was an advance of them doing it themselves. As far as redundancy goes, there's certainly redundancy in basically all of it. We have a infrastructure as a service in the cloud that's provided by the state uh, in the data center, and we have managed services that's also provided. And uh, as far as savings go, uh, when, I, when I look at our numbers, we're running at 50% of the cost to the state that uh, it costed to run the application in our state data center, and uh, the application is actually uh, performing at a higher level, so it services more users. Uh, and then I think the last piece was um, 
something around IT state charges. So once we moved in December of last year to the cloud, and so our budget for the for the system continued to be applied to the state data center until we got past the end of the year. So there was a whole set of dynamics that we worked with the legislative staff and our and our um, data center around, given the reality for how the state data center is funded. Hi, this is Jay. Also. Um, there's a there's a lot of different perspectives to to look at here, especially when you start dealing with with potential cost savings and actual cost savings. Um, you know, being able to properly leverage obviously the resources if you do it correctly, you are going to save money a lot of the time. Uh, at a minimum, um, you're also going to reap a lot of benefits that you potentially never be able to uh, you know buy uh, beforehand. So. I would argue that there's there's very few, if any, states in the nation that would be able to afford a fully redundant infrastructure that a cloud provider would would give you uh, if you properly leverage the services as having uh, resources replicated to multiple physical data centers, uh, having data replicated between multiple racks within that same data center. These are things that, that are just very expensive uh, components to not only buy but then maintain uh, on an ongoing basis also taking use of the the consume and, and basically buy and consume at the same time. Uh, one of the easiest things to look at there in terms of saving money is, is things like a backup or restore infrastructure. Uh, you know, being able to, to build that on-prem, you have to buy the majority of the storage that you're going to use right off the bat. Uh, whether you're going to use it or not, you have, to, you have to forecast for how much you're going to use, and that's a very large cost outlay. Using something on a consume basis, it, it allows us to use that infrastructure for only what we actually need but it expand at an infinite level and use all of what we need at any point in time without having that huge initial cost outlay and then of course on-prem management after that. Uh, in terms of, of dealing with the, the state charges from this, one of the big things about that is, is just making sure that people that you need to justify these costs against understand the difference between owning the IT infrastructure uh, versus essentially renting the IT infrastructure at this point in time. Uh, being able to properly uh, explain that to them so they actually understand these things and understand the reason as to why in some, in some cases it is better to go to a cloud infrastructure than hosting it on-prem, uh, then we find that the those hurdles are fairly easy to get over, uh, but that is a, can be a fairly large hurdle in terms of properly explaining and making sure that that is consumed correctly. Thank you very much. This is Nick Moser again. Uh, we ha are, have run out of time for the question and answer session. If anybody has additional questions that they would like answered, please feel free to enter them into the chat box and we will follow up with you after afterwards. Panelists, again, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've contributed today. This has been so fascinating. I'm stealing Joyce Rose's thunder, though. So with that, I will transition to Joyce. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Uh, obviously, I think we could go for another hour um, in discussing this particular topic. Uh, very interesting and very fascinating. So I also, on behalf of the Children's Bureau, want to thank our panelists, Linda, Jay, Valley, and Joe. Um, if any of you would like to contact them directly, their contact info is listed. Contact information for the presenters is as follows. Linda Jewell, email linda dot jewell at azdcs dot gov. Jay Klein, email jay dot cline at azdcs dot gov. Valimanalan Thurgnanum, email v a l l i m a n a l a n dot t h i r u g n a n a m at maryland dot gov. Joe Vastola, email j o s e p h dot v a s t o l a at m y f l families dot com. And this webinar has been recorded and will be made available online. When it is complete and posted, a message will be sent announcing availability on the Children's Bureau website. Uh, in terms of upcoming events, uh, those topics are uh, under discussion right now, and uh, the schedule will be posted starting in October. So thank you all for attending, and that ends the roundtable discussion. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>